Okay, welcome to uh, Psych 235, uh, Child Psychology. Today we're talking about uh, still the period of early childhood, those ages of two to six, also called the play years, and we're talking about biosocial development. So let's get started. Okay, we're gonna talk about all of this. We're gonna talk about body shape and growth, eating habits, brain development. I know you guys don't find that that interesting, but we need to talk about it. And then motor skills, which are a little bit more interesting. And at the end, something that's kind of sad, injuries and abuse. So let's get to that. So body shape and growth first, okay? Um, if you've uh, had children before, or you've been paying attention at all to children, you know that they grow very fast, okay? Um, and um, well, not as fast as during ages zero to two, right? But they, they're still growing fast, and children during this time, from two to six, actually become slimmer. Uh, what that means is they look longer, okay? Um, they no longer look like uh, chubby little fat men, okay? They, they look slimmer, they have less body fat, okay? They don't need as many calories per pound of body fat. That'll come up when we talk about nutrition. So they look slimmer, they get longer, and that's usually because, you know, well, they, you know, they get taller, okay? The, the, a lot of the length, the height is added in their legs. Their legs get a lot longer. Uh, their arms also get longer. So the extremities of the body get longer and they're still growing really fast. They gain about three inches, about four and a half pounds per year. So they're still growing really fast, not as fast as during the first two years, but still very, very fast. The average six year old is about 46 pounds, 46 ounces. I mean, 46 pounds, I, 46 pounds and basically is about 46 inches tall. And that's easy to remember, okay? So children are longer, okay? Uh, like I said, they look slimmer, they're taller. So they look different than they do uh, in those first couple of years. Uh, they no longer have much of that protruding belly. You know how basically uh, newborns have big bellies. They just look like, they just look like little fat men, like I said. Uh, by the time they're two, they may still have a little bit of that belly, but as they get older, uh, that's, you know, going to disappear. Unless your kid's like obese, then it might not go away. But uh, um, yeah, by the time they're closer to six, actually even uh, years before that, uh, that belly will be mostly gone and they won't look that, that way anymore. They won't look like little fat men anymore. Okay. Um, no more short limbs. Um, you know, the limbs lengthen the arms and legs. No more round face. Okay. So no more protruding belly and no more of that stuff too. I should have uh, indented a little bit more so you know that it that it also, there's no more of that also. Uh, so the face doesn't look as round anymore, right? The cheeks aren't as chubby. Um, it's just part of development. They, they look slimmer. Uh, the head doesn't look as large anymore because their body's gotten longer. And then in proportion, their head uh, doesn't look as big compared to the rest of their body. It is still big and they still look very cute. That's what makes children look uh, really cute is the fact that they have big heads and big eyes. Um, but um, their head doesn't look so big compared to the rest of their bodies uh, during this period of time. And that's because their body uh, lengthens. But their head is still quite large compared to the rest of their body if you compare it to adults. Uh, because remember, by age two, uh, you know, a child's head is actually quite large already compared to the rest of their body. And their body has to kind of catch up. Uh, and it gets a lot longer. And uh, the head doesn't look so big. And there's a picture there of a, uh, I think it's supposed to be like a, maybe a two-year-old. I don't know two years and how many months, um, but that's what they look like. And you can see all of that uh, that we just talked about. Okay, um, eating habits. Of course, growth uh, development has a lot to do with eating habits, whether they're gonna get taller, or slimmer, that kind of stuff, right? Uh, so nutrition, you know, what children eat and all that stuff is gonna affect that stuff, but also genetically, some are gonna be taller than others, okay? Uh, some are just gonna have different features, okay? And their health will also affect their height, their weight, all those things are related. Uh, all these things, nutrition, genes, health, affect uh, uh, you know, uh, height and growth and basically uh, weight. Uh, and it accounts for actually the, uh, the lower height that we see in poorer nations. A lot of the lower height that we see in poorer nations is actually due to nutrition and health, which uh, I believe comes up. Uh, nutrition, okay. Um, yeah, I mean, if you don't eat enough, the body's not going to grow properly. We already said that. That came up, you know, when we talked about those first couple of years. Well, it's still happening here, right? It can still affect your growth, okay? 
Uh, and of course, if you're in your in bad health, also if you have certain gastrointestinal problems or other problems, uh, you cannot absorb nutrients as effectively, and you may not get grow as tall or gain as much weight as you otherwise could. And genetics, of course, uh, have a big influence. You know, some people are just uh, genetically programmed to be taller than others, and that's just the way it is. But we're going to focus more on nutrition and uh, health, right? Uh, because um, you know, appetite, okay, well, what you eat is a, is a prime importance during this time. It always is, but uh, it actually, appetite actually decreases from ages two to six, okay? Infants, I mean, these uh, kids no longer have to eat around the clock like they might when they were, you know, uh, newborns, okay? Um, so appetite actually decreases. They don't need as many calories per pound of body fat, okay, or per pound. Um, so uh, children may not eat as much as they did, uh, you know, uh, during the first two years. And that often wor worries parents, especially mothers. Mothers often fret that their children don't eat enough, that they're all skin and bones and that they're, you know, that they're not eating enough. But it's normal that children eat less during this time. Okay, not necessarily less, but they don't eat as often. Uh, you're not feeding them constantly, okay? Uh, and uh, sometimes children don't get all the vitamins and minerals that they need. Uh, especially iron, calcium, and, and, and zinc. Those three things have been shown to be uh, lacking in a lot of uh, kids' diets during this age. Uh, and the reason for that is that kids during this age, you know, uh, you know they, they're capable of eating, you know, more solid food. And parents often give them a lot of junk food, a lot of snacks, okay, like potato chips and cookies, right? Soda, and, you know, instead of uh, milk, you know, or, you know, snacks instead of soda. So they eat a lot of junk food or parents give them a lot of junk food, or what we call comfort food, you know, those cookies, those potato chips, you know, that chocolate, things like that. Kids love that stuff, candy, and parents may give them a lot of that stuff, and those are empty calories. Usually, a, these snacks that they give them is usually a bunch of sugar, a bunch of fat, a bunch of salt, uh, and not too many uh, minerals and vitamins. Not enough, usually, of that iron, that calcium, that, that zinc. They need to drink more milk, they need to eat their vegetables, the legumes, you know, uh, yogurt, things like that, okay? High calorie, these high calorie foods that you, you know, you found in this package form, right? The snacks, right, are often inadequate. Like I said, they don't contain all that stuff, all those vitamins and minerals, they're often lacking, uh, but they do reduce appetite further, right? They do fill them up, and then the kids might not eat enough of the stuff that they do need, the stuff that is healthy. So you have to watch out for that. Okay, and we'll talk more about nutrition later on because we'll eventually get to things like obesity. And I'll have a lot to say about that and, uh, you know, this junk food again. Um, you know, there's uh, a lot of children uh, during this age also show what we call the uh, just right behavior, you know, uh, hazards of just right. Um, a lot, you know, and that manifests itself in the, in the sense that children, there's, certain, there's a lot of children that only eat certain kinds of foods if it's prepared a certain way, that they want their food to be presented or prepared in a certain way or only want to eat certain kinds of foods, okay? Like maybe they want, for instance, their peas not to be touching, you know, their meat or something like that, or the uh, mashed potato not to be touching the bread or something like that, depending on what they're eating, okay? And they're very particular about these things. Uh, they're very fussy, okay? Um, this would be pathological, which means a sign of uh, mental, uh, mental illness if you were talking about an adult who behaved this way, right? Doesn't want the peas, you know, to touch the mead or the mashed potatoes touch the bread. If an adult kind of acts that way, that probably indicates something like obsessive compulsive disorder, OCD, or some other psychological problem. But when you see these kinds of things in children, it's actually normal, okay? A lot of children exhibit these kinds of behaviors, but in some, it could be a bigger problem uh, that you might need to get checked out. Uh, there are some children, for instance, who just refuse to eat uh, certain kinds of food unless, um, you know, unless it's uh, junk food, for instance. You got them so used to junk food and now they refuse to eat anything else that may be healthy or actually good for them. And in that case, you might want to see a nutritionist. You know, you kind of spoiled the kid too much. You have a lot of influence over what they eat. But I've heard of children, for instance, who refuse to eat anything except McDonald's, for instance. And that's a problem, okay? You have a lot of influence over what your kids eat, but they've gotten used to that. Um, I actually have a nephew <clears throat> who refuses to eat anything at all, even McDonald's, unless it's basically, it's a couple of things he will eat are, uh, you know, the top ramen, you know, those, those noodles that come in a 
dried up square, uh, but he likes it, um, you know, boiled, boiled and stuff, but without any flavoring, which is weird, okay? Uh, but he will not eat ice cream. He won't eat cookies. He won't eat burgers or anything. Oh, another thing he does like, so I misspoke a little bit earlier. Another thing he does like, he will eat is those chicken McNuggets. So basically chicken McNuggets and that very cold, that plain without uh, top ramen without any flavor. And that's really weird. And the parents are very worried. He doesn't eat anything else. So they have to supplement. You have to give him vitamins, all this other stuff to make sure he's getting the proper nutrients. And yes, they, you know, they are taking him to a nutritionist. But yeah, that kid's got some real problems there. But you will see similar behaviors in, uh, in your children. Um, so be prepared for that. It doesn't mean that there's necessarily anything wrong with them, but if, if it is extreme, it might indicate a problem. Um, there was a survey that was done on like 1,500 uh, parents. They asked them about their children. They asked them about their one to six-year-olds. And not just about eating habits, but about the habits of their one to six-year-olds. And the survey indicated that about three, four, 75% of three-year-olds showed some evidence of this just right tendency where they want things to be done in a certain way. Like for instance, they prefer, yeah, they want things done in a certain order. Like for instance, that, you know, first you, you know, like for instance, you eat and then maybe you watch some TV, then they get their bath, then they get a story and then they fall asleep, right? Then, then they can fall asleep, right? Cause you put them to bed. Um, and if you don't do it in that order, they won't fall asleep, right? So that's very common. You, you'll see things like that. They get used to having things done in a certain way. And if, they, if, they aren't, if they, that doesn't happen, they won't fall asleep or they won't do what, they're, what you want them to do. Um, they may have a strong preference to wear or not wear certain clothes. There are certain kids, for instance, who always want to wear blue or black or something like that. My son's on the autism spectrum, so he showed a lot of that. Uh, it doesn't necessarily mean they have autism, but my son showed a lot of that. He really likes green and he wants to wear green clothes all the time, okay? But you'll see some similar behavior in children. They might only wanna wear shorts or pants or something like that, even if it's hot. My son has a thing right now where he only wants, he's uh, seven years old. He's a little bit beyond this period or right, or right at the end. Um, you know, he only wants to wear pants, even if it's 110 degrees outside. You know, and we do go outside to play, uh, just pants. You know, at some point, you know, he'll probably switch that, you know, to just wanting to wear shorts. But they'll show things like that, uh, these kids. Um, and they may show evidence, you know, that they, you know, I talked about the bedtime routine, right? Um, or, or preference for certain foods, only junk food or snack foods or certain kinds of food. Um, and, uh, you know, like I said before, you have a lot of influence on that as to what your children get used to eating. Okay, but this just right tendencies where they want things done in a certain way is actually very common. Okay, so let's keep going. Um, a lot of kids during this time uh, may also show allergies. Okay, about three to eight percent of preschool children, children during this age, uh, can have specific allergies. Some can be, uh, for instance, allergic to cow's milk, uh, you know, that they're lactose intolerant, or some of them allergic to eggs, peanuts, or tree nuts, soy, wheat, fish, shellfish. Allergies come in many forms. Okay, um, and it could be linked to, uh, you know, medical conditions, you know, where, yeah, maybe they have a real allergy that causes a physical reaction, um, you know, or, you know, that actually causes a rash or something that, you know, it makes them sick or vomit or, or, or causes something, something serious. Um, um, but um, yeah, they're often linked to things like that. Um, but the diagnostic standards uh, actually vary, okay? Whether they have a, uh, an allergy or not, uh, maybe they're not allergic, maybe they just don't like it, okay? Um, and it could be something psychological, right? Why they're exhibiting this, you know, the, what seems like an allergy. Um, or maybe it could be really something, uh, something medical. Um, it just, uh, it depends, you know? Um, like for instance, when I touch uh, like a, like a juniper, the leaves of a juniper, juniper, right? Or the, you know, the, well, the green stuff of the juniper, um, I actually develop a rash. Does that mean I'm allergic to that stuff? You know, maybe the diagnostic standards uh, vary, you know, maybe you're, they, whether you have an allergy or not depends on, you know, how they test you or, you know, or the kind of test they use and whether they determine if it's an allergy or not. Um, and treatment also varies. How do they treat this, right? Maybe they could tell you to totally avoid, uh, as a child, right? Maybe you totally avoid, you know, uh, you know the cow's milk, uh, eggs, uh, peanuts, or whatever it is uh, that you're allergic to. Or maybe they have you, uh, 
take in small amounts, small increment exposure, right? Uh, medically supervised, right? So you get used to it, okay? And by the way, these allergies can be outgrown. Sometimes you outgrow them and you're not allergic later on, or they can actually increase and get worse, right? Or they may actually decrease, so you're not so allergic, but you're still allergic, okay? A lot of it has to do with exposure, uh, allergies. Sometimes it's just something medical, something biological, you can't help, but sometimes it has to do with exposure. Uh, there are a lot of kids, for instance, who are allergic to cow's milk. And by the way, you shouldn't be giving your kids like milk in like the first year of life, but we're beyond that now. But this time they should be able to drink cow's milk. Um, but some of them are, uh, you know, lactose intolerant. They can't really consume it and it gives them stomach cramps. It causes them problems, diarrhea or something like that. Um, but um, sometimes it has to do with exposure. It could be that, you know, they're just not used to it. You know, they haven't had enough uh, enough milk of that kind. Um, and I know this because in countries where they don't drink a lot of cow's milk, there's a lot of people there that are lactose intolerant because they don't have that exposure, okay? Um, and that's the way it is. Sometimes you just, uh, the children just aren't used to it. Um, I am actually, uh, you know, vegetarian and uh, I actually consider myself, you know, um, somewhat vegan uh, because when I went to the doctor, they, uh, they told me uh, that, uh, you know, I need to watch my cholesterol a little bit. And that surprised me to say, well, I'm vegetarian. What the heck am I doing wrong? And they're, well, the only thing I eat that has any cholesterol in it is cheese, eggs, milk, that kind of stuff. So I mostly cut that stuff out. I will still have pizza once in a while, maybe once a year or something like that. I'll have eggs when I visit my mom and she cooks me some breakfast, but uh, not that often. But for the most part, I'm vegan. And I I'm, I'm can tell you now that, uh, you know, uh, after years of basically uh, avoiding dairy, uh, you know, now I can't tolerate cow's milk anymore. Now I seem to have that allergy. I'm lactose intolerant now. Okay. So these things can grow, they can increase, they can decrease. And sometimes it has to do with whether your body's used to it or not. But it could be something else, something that's just medical, something you, can, you just can't help. Um, all right, so this is biosocial development. So we also need to talk about the brain. Okay, we talked about, you know, growth and nutrition, those things are related, but brain development is also related to growth, of course, you know. Uh, I mentioned that the, um, that the children's heads don't look so big from ages two to six uh, anymore compared to the rest of their body, and that's because, you know, um, their limbs get longer, okay. Uh, and the thing is that, uh, the brain, it does grow quickly, but it doesn't grow as quickly during this time. We mentioned this, I think, before, that um, the brain uh, is about 75% of its adult weight by age two. So by age two, children's heads are already quite big, okay? Uh, and they're 75% of, uh, you know, of, their, of the adult weight. Um, by age five, it'll be 90%. So their heads grow very quickly at the beginning, and then not as quickly, 90% by, by age five. Uh, by about age uh, seven, uh, their brain is, weighs about as much as it's gonna weigh, okay? But the body's growing faster, okay? But the point is here about the brain, you need to know what is the percentage of, uh, of weight uh, by age two, by five, by, by seven. And there we have an image of the brain just to remind you what it looks like and some of the various parts of the cerebral cortex. Um, there's something known as myelination that you guys need to know about. Uh, myelination, actually, uh, if, if I think I mentioned this before, it speeds neurotransmission. Myelination is that fatty insulation around neurons, okay, um, that makes uh, basically transmission of the electrical signals. That's the way neurons communicate. It makes them uh, transmit faster, right? It, it, it increases the speed of, this, uh, of the transmission, right? So it allows faster transmission of signals and therefore allows children to communicate in more complex ways, okay? Signals have to travel fast from one part of the brain to another for a lot of things to happen, okay? And the faster they travel, which, you know, and the speed is increased by myelin, uh, the better that works. So children get better at hearing and speaking, right? As there is more myelination, right? Better at catching and throwing a ball, okay? Yes, catching requ requires uh, coordination of several brain areas, so does throwing a ball. Um, they get better at these things. Infants, right, um, might notice like, you know, when they're closer to two years of age, uh, they're clumsy, okay? They easily fall, they can't catch a, goal, a ball very well, and they're very forgetful. Um, and as they get older, they're not as clumsy. They get a lot better. And we'll talk about those things when we talk about motor skills, okay? Uh, yeah, we'll also talk about cognitive development uh, next chapter, and we'll talk about how memory improves, right? 
but this all is all possible because of uh, the nor the transmission of the electrical signals um, that, that the neurons are si uh, are sending, and the fact that myelination, the fatty insulation around the neurons, makes the signals travel faster. And of course, it also is affected by experience. As children, ex you know, you know, as children play and learn and do the things that they do, um, the wiring of the brain is being affected by that. Uh, connections are being formed. Okay, and yes, myelin is also, you know, happening, myelination. So experience affects myelination, like I said. So if in, infants uh, actually spend more time looking and listening during this time, they're better able to do that. Okay, they, you know, they're just, uh, their brains work better, okay? The visual and the auditory cortex are the parts of the brain that get myelinated first, okay? Um, they're the ones that get myelinated uh, first, so that, you know, they get better at looking and listening, which is good because they have to learn language, which we'll, we'll talk about more uh, eventually. Um, during the play years, this, this period of time, ages two to six, uh, my, myelination also occurs when it comes to memory and reflection, okay? So memory uh, gets a lot better. Ch children are able to stop and think that's reflection, okay? So five-year-olds are actually less impulsive, right, uh, than a two-year-old because five-year-olds can actually stop and think before they act. So they can, you know, stop, right, think, right, look around, uh, and maybe cross the street. I still wouldn't let a five-year-old cross the street by themselves, but some parents do. I've seen kids out here crossing, you know, very busy streets uh, on their own. But uh, five-year-olds are less impulsive. You still need to watch them, be careful, but they're less impulsive than two-year-old children. Two-year-olds, I mean, you have to watch all the time uh, because they're very clumsy, they're impulsive, and they'll do something without thinking, okay? Myelination makes coordinated reflection possible, right? It makes them, uh, it makes this possible for them to stop and think, okay? They can stop, think, and remember before crossing the street, okay? That's important as opposed to just, you know, moving on ahead and stuff. Uh, and it's also important for like, you know, kids can get into a lot of trouble and, and, uh, and have problems, uh, you know, get hurt and stuff like that. We'll talk about that when we get to injuries and abuse, but it also has to do with this myelination, you know, uh, if they don't stop and think and they just walk right into the swimming pool and fall into the deep end, that can be a big problem. We'll talk about those injuries in a bit. Um, more about brain development. Uh, um, lateralization is, uh, is also important and it, it's something uh, that happens. Uh, you know, during this time. Um, lateralization means that the two sides of the brain specialize. They specialize in certain functions, okay? And not everything is lateralized, but certain things are, like motor function, and that what, by motor function, we mean movement, um, that becomes lateralized, where the left side of the brain controls the right side of the body and vice versa. So the left side of your brain, the left side of the motor cortex, if you remember, that's the part of the brain that controls movement, uh, the left side of the motor cortex controls the right side of the body when it comes to movement. And the right side of the motor cortex, the right side of the brain controls the left side of the body. And that's just the way it is. So, so one side controls the other side, okay? When it comes to one side of the brain controls the other side of the body. That's the way it is. So it's, that's lateralization. That means that functions are on one side or another, of uh, one side of the brain. The left side of the brain also seems to have more to do with logic, things related to math, detailed analysis, Language is on the left side of the brain for the most part. Um, the right side of the brain uh, controls more things that have to do with, uh, you know, more, it's, the right side of the brain is more the emotional and creative side of the brain, right? Um, create, by creativity, we're talking about music, art, poetry, and that's also related to emotion, right? Because it, it's about how it feels. It's about, you know, it's about that kind of stuff. It's about being creative, okay? So certain functions are lateralized where they're more on one side than another, but if you damage the left side of the brain, right, and if that damage occurs early, the brain might be able to actually switch and rewire itself, right, where the language side, if you damage the left side, you damage the side that's to do with language, it might be able to shift to the right side, okay? Um, that kind of thing has been known to happen. It doesn't happen often, but it has been, it has been known to happen, so the brain, is kind of what we call plastic. It can uh, readjust or rewire itself to some extent under some circumstances, but that's still research that's ongoing. We know exactly why all that happens in some, but not others, okay? Um, you also need to know about the corpus callosum. I might've mentioned some of this before, but remember the corpus callosum is that bridge, the main bridge, the main connection between the two halves of the brain, the two hemispheres that allows one side of the brain to communicate with the other, 
the signals travel back and forth, mainly uh, by crossing the uh, corpus callosum there, okay? So if you think about it, when you do something, uh, you use both sides of your brain. Like when you walk, you're using both the left and the right side of your body. And, you know, basically both the left and the right side of, uh, you know, the motor cortex. The signals have to travel back and forth. Um, same thing when it comes to language. You know, you might be uh, speaking, right? Uh, and you are, uh, you know, you're using the language part of your brain, which is on the left side of your brain. Uh, but you're also, uh, you know, talking and that's movement, okay? Uh, speaking. Uh, and the signals have to travel back and forth. You might be walking as you're talking, and you're usually doing several things at once. So the signals have to travel back and forth, okay? But remember, the corpus callosum is, uh, is this bundle of nerves, right? This connection among the two hemispheres. It contains about 250 to 800 million fibers, million connections or so, that coordinate the action of the two hemispheres. It myelinates rapidly from ages two to six. So the brain is able to communicate, right? Uh, one half with the other, uh, increasingly uh, more effectively during this time because of myelination, which speeds the neurotransmissions. Okay, so that allows the two sides of the brain to communicate. And that affects, you know, a lot of different skills. Movement, you know, cognitive skills, right? The left side of the brain needs to communicate with the right and vice versa, right? And uh, I know we just talked about lateralization, how some functions are more on the left side or the right side of the brain, like language is more on the left. Uh, you know, creativity is more on the right. But there's no such thing as a left, uh, a left brain person or a right brain person. You are using your entire brain. You're using both halves of your brain. They communicate with each other all the time, okay? So yes, while some functions are more on one side than the other, you're not really right-brained or left-brained. You're using your entire brain. Let's keep going. Something uh, else that matures, uh, the brain is you know, always developing, okay? Uh, actually, it doesn't really stop developing up until maybe you're Actually, it, it, it's always changing, okay? But as far as, you know, when it's fully developed, when the brain is fully formed, fully developed, uh, according to some, it might be when you're 18, 19. According to others, it might be when you're 20, 21. So uh, the brain continues to develop, okay? And one important part of uh, the brain that needs to develop uh, quite well is the prefrontal cortex. Remember that the prefrontal cortex is what allows you to control yourself, right? Control those impulses. Um, you know, to have self-control, right? To focus on certain things and not others, right? To control your emotions. It allows you to be self-aware, right? And know what you're doing. Um, you know, so it's, a, it's the executive part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, okay? And it matures, uh, it can, it matures, but it doesn't stop maturing. It's not fully mature up until your late teens, early 20s. It's the last part of the brain to actually fully mature. But it is maturing during this time from ages two to six, okay? And when this front part of the brain, the prefrontal cortex, you know, as it gets more mature, it makes certain things possible. Uh, something that occurs during this time is called perseveration. Okay, that's the tendency of children to stick to one thought or action uh, and continue thinking the same thing or doing the same thing, even after it has become useless or inappropriate or annoying, like they may sing the same song over and over again, right? Or watch the same movie, okay? or they draw the same picture, they watch the same show, they throw a tantrum. This is all due to perseveration, which has to do the, with the prefrontal cortex, their ability to focus, right? Or do something again and again, they keep focusing on that thing, right? Um, the prefrontal cortex makes those things possible. By three or four years of age, uh, further advances in the prefrontal cortex make impulse control and formal education possible. So by three or four years of age, children can control their emotions, their behavior, enough so that, uh, you know, you can start thinking about putting them in school. Maybe preschool, right, depending on how old they are, right? If they're closer to three, you know, preschool, four years of age, still preschool, right? By five, it's more like kindergarten if you wait that long. But yeah, by three, four years of age, you can, you know, their brain is advanced enough that they can control themselves a little bit, and then they can follow some rules, sit there and be quiet and control themselves a bit, and they, that makes education possible. Okay, formal education, that means when they go to school right? Temper tantrums also will decrease due to the prefrontal cortex, right? They can stop and think and control themselves, right? Uh, so temper tantrums are very common among two-year-olds, less common by age five. By age five, they're a lot better at controlling themselves, you know, throw tantrums less often. And of course, tantrums are a lot less common in adulthood. 
but they do happen when people are adults as well. We just don't call them temper tantrums. You know, we say that somebody had, uh, you know, that they threw a fit or they went into a rage, right? That's also kind of like a tantrum, but we don't call it that uh, as, you know, when you're an adult. But that's the same thing that children are doing. Okay, let's keep going. Um, we need to talk about other parts of the brain. The limbic system, uh, the limbic system, to put it uh, succinctly, uh, actually uh, deals with, uh, you know, um, emotion, motivation. Actually, yeah, emotion, learning, and memory, okay? So it deals with emotional things, but it also deals with learning and memory. Uh, so the limbic system, one, it's, there's several important things that it involves, but we're gonna talk about these three things. Uh, the limbic system includes the amygdala. The amygdala is the part of your brain, actually, that responds to aggression and fear. It's the part of your brain that makes you aggressive and makes you fearful. Like if there's something that comes up, if there's, you know, if you see, uh, you know, a scary dog or something like that. We're talking about little kids here, or maybe they see someone that they don't know. The amygdala is the part of the brain that makes them fearful, right? It's response for nightmares. When they have nightmares, right, and they get scared, that's because of the amygdala. It triggers that fear, you know, which then, you know, and then the amygdala communicates with other parts of the brain and, you know, during sleep, and that can lead to nightmares. Or fear of the boogeyman, right? Or, you know, uh, fear of dogs, whatever it is. Fear, aggression are due to the amygdala, okay? So when you see children are really scared, right, especially of things that shouldn't be scared of, that's because of the amygdala. The hippocampus is involved with, uh, with memories. It allows the brain to store memories, okay? Uh, and that's, that's related to learning and memory. Yes, it is, but it's also related to emotional behavior because children can remember something, okay? Uh, and then, uh, you know, and then remember that they shouldn't be afraid of it. Or they can remember something and it could be something that's scary and that can make them afraid. So these parts of the brain communicate with one another. But the hippocampus is involved with memory. Emotional events are easier to remember, okay? So that time when they got hurt or they got scratched by the cat or something like that, or they saw a scary dog or a scary movie, they will remember that more easily, okay? Now, things have to do with content or source memory, that's kind of limited, right? When you ask them, like, if they know, you know, if they know what a, you know, like, a, 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 what a volcano is, right? And you ask them about that, right? Um, they may not be able to tell you, you know, where they learned that from. They might say something like, well, I always knew that. I, or I figured it out myself, right? Um, memory is not a, as good for those things. Remembering where they learned something or actually remembering uh, something that has more to do with content, you know, like what something is called or what something is, that's more limited. But emotional stuff is very easy to remember, okay? The hypothalamus is also part of the limbic system. The hypothalamus actually uh, triggers the fight or flight response. It controls the fight or flight response. And the fight or flight response has to do with stress and anxiety. When you're stressed out, you're anxious, you're something scary, your body basically gets, you know, and your brain kick into high gear, right? The hypothalamus sends a signal to the amygdala, right? Um, which, uh, and, and basically, uh, no, response to signals from the amygdala. The amygdala, remember, response for aggression and fear, right? So you see something that's scary, for instance, the amygdala sends a signal, the hypothalamus then triggers the flight or flight response. Um, but the hypothalamus also responds to signals from the hippocampus, right? Um, the hippocampus, right, has to do with memory. So you might remember that maybe that dog or that cat is not dangerous, right? Because you've seen that dog before, or that cat before, and that may help you calm down. So the amygdala is arousing, basically. It triggers fear uh, and aggression, and the hippocampus may be dampening. In other words, it reduces fear. It might reduce aggression if you remember that things are not that bad, right? That those things are not so scary. But the hypothalamus controls the, flight or fl the fight or flight response by basically communicating with the amygdala and the hippocampus, okay? So it can, it can increase stress or anxiety or it can reduce it, right? In general, prolonged stress in children uh, may lead to poor emotional regulation and cognitive impairment, right? If children are exposed to stress for long periods of time, uh, it makes them basically jumpy. It makes them, you know, uh, they behave as if they're always stressed, right? Always aroused. They're always looking around like something bad is going to happen. And that, of course, will affect their ability to learn, right? They can't focus very well, right? Um, it'll impair them cognitively. You know, they won't do as well in school. They, it'll be harder for them to focus, harder for them to learn and remember things because they're always on edge, so to speak. And poor emotional regulation. They'll overreact to things, easily cry or get easily upset right? Uh, all that is part of the limbic system that involves the amygdala, the hippocampus, and the hypothalamus. The hypothalamus is what controls the fight or flight response. 
Motor skills. Let's talk about motor skills. Well, whenever you see the word motor in a developmental psychology class, that has to do with movement. So skills have to do with movement. So uh, children, uh, you know, develop more coordination, you know, um, from ages two to six. And again, that's because of the brain that's developing, right? The myelination that's occurring in the brain, you know, that speeds neurotransmission, but also because of experience, okay? Experience is important, okay? Children get slimmer, they get stronger, they're less top heavy, okay? So their heads aren't as big compared to the rest of their body. So they're better, better able to, um, you know, to control uh, their bodies because of the brain as well, because of the brain as well. Uh, but also because their heads aren't as heavy compared to the rest of the body, okay? Uh, that prefrontal cortex is more advanced, right? There's more myelination, they can stop and think, right? So their movements, their, mo their motor skills get a lot better. And there's two types of motor skills. There's gross motor skills and fine motor skills. The gross motor skills, Remember, which we mentioned have to do with uh, the movement of large bones and muscles, you know, running, climbing, jumping, right? Um, <clears throat> they improve dramatically, gross motor skills. As we said before, two-year-olds are very clumsy. They find it difficult, you know, to like catch a ball. They can run and easily trip and hurt themselves, right? Um, five, by five years of age, children are, tr are quite graceful, very skilled, okay? Some more than others, of course. Um, and they can do a lot more things. You know, they, they can run, they can play on the monkey bars, they can climb, they can do all these things. Um, <clears throat> some of them are able to skate, dive, ride a bicycle. It just depends on experience and how skilled your child is. But when we're talking about movement of large bones and muscles, that has to do with uh, gross motor skills. And all this is improving. And they get a lot better from ages two to six. From uh, two, they're not very good. By six, uh, they may already be... Uh, you know, as, as good as you are, depending on how old you are, okay? Or it might be hard to keep up with them as, you know, they can maybe run fast, they can climb. So, uh, you know, they get a lot better. And um, fine motor skills have to do with small body movements, uh, movement of the hands, the fingers. By the way, a lot of activities, I just want to mention, a lot of activities actually involve both uh, gross and uh, motor movement and fine motor movement, okay? Where, like when you're climbing, you're not just moving your arms and legs, but you're use, also using your fingers. So this distinction is, you know, is, uh, is important, but just know that you, you're usually using both, both, okay? But some involve more fine motor skills um, and some uh, more motor skills. So fine motor skills are actually still difficult for young children. You know, during this age, it's still kind of difficult. Uh, they lack muscular control, right? Um, patience, judgment, hand-eye coordination, uh, the movements, the small movements, right? Their fingers, right? Uh, things like that, uh, small movements, small bones and muscles, it's still kind of difficult for them. They have short, stubby fingers, okay? So their fingers aren't very good for these very fine movements. Neurological immaturity, the brain is still not advanced enough for them to be really good at that. Some are better than others, but they have trouble, for instance, cutting straight, you know, using those scissors, right? Folding paper straight, right? buttoning their shirt, tying their shoes, cutting meat with a knife and fork. They'll get a lot better at this as they get closer to age six, but they're still not that great at it. So motor, gross motor skills, they're, they get, they're quite good at it. They get a lot better at that. Fine motor skills are still lacking, okay? But scissors, pencils, knives, forks, all these things that children you know, tr you know, uh, may try to use are usually made for adults, and it's harder for children to, to make use of those things. But there are scissors, pencils, knives, forks, all that stuff for younger children. And they're usually smaller, thicker, uh, better suited for their small, uh, chubbier hands. Uh, more about motor skills. Motor skills are also related to artwork. And what's related to artwork is actually fine motor skills, okay? Um, and children get a lot better, their artwork gets a lot better from ages two to six. Uh, and children aged two to six are very imaginative. Okay, so they're very imaginative. They think of a lot of things. They can draw a lot of different things. They're very creative and they're not very self-critical, you know, and you know, you can tell that, yeah, their artwork might not be that good to, compared to an adult, uh, but they think it's great. They think it's awesome. And you should too also, by the way, you should encourage them and not criticize them, right? Because, because they're, they're very expressive, very creative, right? And they love to draw, they love art. Okay, and this, this is all good for their development. As the brain and their fine motor skills mature, their artwork greatly improves, okay? They will get a lot better. You can see there the first picture on the lower left there. That's probably a two-year-old, uh, maybe two and a half, something like that. Uh, maybe three, I'm not sure. But you can see, I don't know if you can see really well, but uh, they can't really draw very much. Except maybe make a few circles, right? A few ovals. Uh, they're not great, okay? 
um, by age four, which is the picture in the middle, they can draw a lot better. So you can see that those are some people this little girl drew. And then by age six, which is the, you know, the, the last picture right there on the lower right, um, they're a lot better. You can see the, uh, there's a bit more detail in that picture, the individual hairs and stuff like that, it's a lot better. But it all depends on the child. Some are much better at art than others. Some will develop those fine motor skills a lot quicker than others, okay? And it it's just depends on, uh, on genetics and also experience. Um, but uh, it all has to do with fine motor skills, okay? Artwork specifically has to do with fine motor skills. And, and so does playing an instrument, by the way, uh, and other things, you know, uh, that are very creative things like maybe creating something out of clay or, or you know, just, or, or dancing, which can involve fine movements as well. Um, a lot of that involves fine motor skills. Some of those things more than others, but art definitely involves a lot of fine motor skills. And adults need to set the stage for these kind of things, this development, right? Adults need to facilitate a safe place for children to play, right? You need to let them practice these motor skills, right? The gross motor skills, the fine motor skills, get, you know, Hopefully they have a, at home or wherever they live, they have a playground, right? Where they can play and climb and swing and slide, right? But that's also available at parks. You can take them to the park. Make sure they play in an appropriate area with appropriate equipment. And at the park, it usually there's a little sign that says that this is for kids who are, you know, uh, five and older or seven and older, right? Or, or, and this is for kids that are, you know, like, uh, you know, less than five. So you need to pay attention to that stuff so they don't end up falling off you know, some bridge or something like that or some tower that they're climbing on, okay? You need to be there watching them and make sure it's appropriate. You need to give them time to play, right? And, uh, and also, you know, when it comes to art and music, stuff like that, you need to give them a chance for that stuff too, right? To, time for them to practice and, and, and draw and maybe create music in their little toys or whatever it is. You need to facilitate all this for them. It's good for their development, good for their gross motor skills and fine motor skills, the brain development. It's actually a lot of different things. We'll talk more about play during a different chapter. Yeah, and playmates, right? They need to play with other kids. They, they love to play with kids their age. Um, but, um, you know, during the current pandemic, that may be a, uh, a problem, okay? Because, you know, you should be avoiding people who are not in your immediate family. Increased urbanization can uh, hinder or help motor development. Um, you know, it, it usually is a hindrance, right? When there's, when there's just a, a, a lot of congestion, a lot of cars, a lot of smog, a lot of... Um, uh, you know, just not enough room for children to play, not enough parks and things like that. There's usually, in rural areas, there's usually more open space and, uh, and, and more space for children to play in. Um, whereas in big cities, not as much. So um, it depends. If you live in, a, in, in, in the, the nice part of the, of, the, of the city or the neighborhood, that's where you'll have the nicer parks. That's where you'll have more stuff. So it depends on which part of town you're, you're in. Usually we discuss that, but you know, we're doing this on Zoom and I'm recording. Um, now, speaking of cities and stuff like that, uh, large cities and towns and stuff like that can expose children uh, to more pollutants, okay? Things that pollute. Um, and this can be particularly harmful uh, for, uh, for children during this age uh, because their brains are developing very rapidly. Their bodies are growing very rapidly. So pollutants can harm young growing brains and bodies more than older developed ones. You as an adult, right? Uh, your brain is probably fully developed already and your body's probably fully grown, the damage that these pollutants can do is limited. They can still cause, you know, problems. You can still develop cancer, but it'll, that'll develop like, you know, decades later or years later. But these young children are developing very quickly. They are actually more susceptible. Their development can be delayed or negatively affected by these pollutants. And we'll talk about that specifically in a moment, how, how so, how that, how that can happen or some examples. So it's, it's, a very, it's a very strong concern, especially in urban areas and especially for low SES children. By SES, we mean social economic status. In other words, the poor children, right, are the ones that are growing up usually in urban areas where there's a lot of congestion, a lot of smog, a lot of traffic, not enough spaces for them to play. Uh, the poor kids, the poor children, uh, which are often the minority children, uh, often get the worst of everything. You know, they're, they tend to be poor on average, so they live in the worst part of town uh, where the factory is going to be built, the factory that pollutes, right, uh, next to the slaughterhouse with all those nasty smells and all those nasty chemicals, right? Uh, they're, uh, they're, there's going to be more smog in cities, uh, and it's just, uh, there's just more pollution uh, in the bad part of town, okay, in the more urban areas. 
Um, and that's what happens, okay? And it's always the uh, lower socioeconomic status, the poor children who suffer more from this. It will affect asthma and other respiratory problems and other things that we'll talk about in a moment, okay? Uh, sources, there's hundreds of substances in the air, right? Chemicals uh, in the air and the food and the water that can affect brain development. There's electronic waste, which is a big problem nowadays. Um, you know, and guess where the uh, where they're gonna put the uh, the dump site, right? Um, the recycling center, whatever it is, it's not gonna be in the nice part of town, right? So it's always the um, the poor children who will be affected more by these pollutants. Um, so they're especially harmful in uh, early life uh, for children. Children consume a lot of a lot of air, food, and water compared to their, uh, you know, their, uh, their weight, right? For every pound of, of weight that they have, uh, more so than adults, okay? Adults aren't growing as much. Adults don't need to eat as much. And when we do eat too much, that's when we, you know, we get overweight, but children are growing quickly. They need more calories per pound of uh, body fat, per, per pound, basically. So they're more susceptible to these pollutants. They can, uh, they can be, uh, because they're developing and because they consume more compared to their bodies, right? The, their weight and height, uh, they can be affected. Organs are still developing, right? Their heart, you know, their, you know, their brains, all these things, the internal organs are still growing and developing, okay? Um, how do we test for this stuff, right? Is there testing, right? Uh, well, guess what? The, a lot of these things, a lot of these chemicals um, and these uh, formulas, these chemical combinations are very complex. It's very hard to test these things. Uh, you may not know what's in that plastic, right, where you are serving your child cereal, or maybe even worse, if you're giving them some hot soup on some plastic bowl, you don't know if that's leaching any chemicals, right? Um, or some of the things that you may be using, sunscreen, or, or the water that you're drinking, there's a lot of chemicals in that stuff. Is it safe? Uh, there is uh, testing that's now available. You can test for things like lead paint. Uh, you can test for certain chemicals. Um, but it's actually very complex and a lot of chemicals that are actually being used to manufacture things, things that you use every day and things that you're exposed to have not been tested. And we probably won't find out that they're harmful until later, by the time some damage has been done. And we'll talk about some of these things. Like, like I'll give you an example, lead. Lead is something that we found out was harmful uh, a long time ago. Okay, it was identified as a very powerful poison uh, over a century ago. Like the early 1900s, they, they uh, already knew that it was very harmful, but they didn't ban it from, uh, from, uh, from pain until 1978. They went on using it here in the US and selling lead paint for decades afterward. Why? Because, well, this country is very business oriented, right? I mean, this country is a very rich country and the reason it's part, partly very rich is because, of the, because they, they really promote business here. And they found out that lead was poisonous and really bad for development, bad for the brain, right? If children are exposed to that. But what they did is say, okay, we need to give these companies, you know, these businesses, these industries, time for them to adjust and make the changes they need to make to start making lead free paint. And of course they took decades, but eventually it got banned and then they can't sell that anymore. But they gave the businesses plenty of time to adjust. Just like they're gonna give them time to adjust right now with the automobiles and the emissions and the exhaust. Eventually they're gonna ban all that stuff. They're already talking about that. We've known it's harmful for decades, for many decades and what it's doing to the environment. It's not gonna get banned until maybe another 20, 30 years, okay? Um, but that's what happens here. And then a lot of children get exposed to that lead paint, right? Or the asbestos in the, uh, the homes. If you have a popcorn ceiling in your home, that could likely have asbestos that can cause cancer, by the way. Um, and it's always the poorer children, the lower socioeconomic children, especially minority children who live in poor areas uh, that get exposed to more of this stuff. If you live in an older home, right, a home made in the 50s and the 70s, it's, it's very likely that you have harmful things in that home, that there's lead paint, that the plumbing might have lead in it, um, things like that, that the ceiling, if it's especially that popcorn ceiling, right, that was very popular back then. Uh, if you have that, you need to get it tested and get it removed uh, because it probably has asbestos in it. And if they do find it has asbestos in it, it's gonna cost you a lot of money, like $10,000 to get that stuff removed because it's, it's hazardous stuff, okay? Um, and it's always the poor children who are exposed to this stuff. They're the ones who live in the older, crappier homes, okay? Children who are young, low SES, the poor ones, right, are living in this old housing. housing. They tend to have higher levels of exposure to this stuff. 
teenage involvement in impulsive violent crime is linked to lead poisoning. It affects the brain. It, it basically, um, you know, it, it, uh, it damages the brain. And you can see how exposure to lead has kind of varied there. That's what that graph is showing you through the ages um, and how uh, exposure to lead has come down, you know, which is good, right? But less and less children are being exposed to lead nowadays. But yeah, infant brains absorb a lot of lead and it's very, it has a lot of neurotoxicity, which is very harmful, very toxic for the brain. And you know what it does to your kids? It, it makes them less intelligent and it makes them more violent, more aggressive. And you wonder why you have a lot more of those problems in poor, in, in poor inner cities, right? Um, there's something known, known as plumbism. That is the actual uh, scientific term for lead poisoning uh, that happens uh, you know, in the brain. You look there, you see there in the image, there's a composite. Composite means that they combine a lot of images of brains, basically. Uh, composite of 157 brains of adults who as children were exposed to high levels of lead. And the, the part that you see that are in, in uh, red there and in orange and in yellow, those are the ones that have actually have shrunk or, or have actually uh, did not develop properly that are smaller uh, than they should be in, in normal brains. Okay, and of course that will affect intelligence, it will affect aggression, impulsivity, all these things, right? Lead is a particular problem, okay? And it's something that happened in, um, you know, even recently in Flint, Michigan, right? You guys probably heard about that, right? Um, I'm not gonna recap the whole story, but you know, they tried to change the water supply, right? From one source to another, and it led to corrosion of the pipes that were really old and exposed a lot of children to lead, okay? And children, are, remember, are very susceptible to this, stuff, to this stuff. The brains are still developing and, you know, they're very susceptible. Uh, and that's just one example of that. But it ha there's a lot of other examples, right, of being exposed to asbestos and things like that. But in general, just the poor kids are the ones that, you know, have the most risk. It's just always the way it is. The, new, the richer people uh, always live in better parts of town where there's less pollution, um, closer to the beach where there's better weather, right, where the air blows away the smog, and uh, also where... Um, you know, uh, a newer housing that is built that's up to code with newer regulations, you know, with stuff that's safer. The older houses or the older stuff is always worse, okay? That's, there's a reason why old houses are cheaper, okay? That's one reason why, okay? It's because of hazardous stuff, but also, it's also because they weren't, they're not built as well as newer homes, okay? Um, let's talk about other things that are related to this, uh, injuries and abuse, okay? Uh, yes, this, this, uh, this time, ages two to six, is a very uh, dangerous time for children. And especially uh, when it comes to injuries, ages one to four, that's when children are actually the most vulnerable to accidental death and injury. They're very vulnerable during this time because they're walking, they're running, but they're still not very mature as far as you know, their brain. They're still impulsive and they can, they can walk into, let's say, walk right into the pool in the deep end and drown. They, so, you know, cross the street without looking, get hit by a car, right? Very prone to injuries, accidental death and injuries during this time. You have to watch your children very carefully, okay? But a lot of fatal injuries for preschoolers includes, you know, poison, right? You have to keep them away from stuff. You have to have child-proof bottles, right? Caps, right? So they can't open that stuff and, 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 and you know, and then drink that, you know, that, uh, uh, you know, that uh, gasoline or, or drink that, um, you know, that, uh, you know, that cleaning spray or whatever it is, um, children, you'd be surprised. They'll get into all sorts of things and you have to make sure that you keep these things in places where children can reach them. And even then that they have caps that children can't open. And a lot of these harmful things now come with these childproof caps, even medicines and things like that, right? But you have to be careful with them around fire as well. You know, they can easily get burned. You know, they don't think that much, okay? They can choke very easily, so make sure that when you eat, you give them something that's solid, right? That you cut into little pieces for them that they can swallow because they often don't chew things thoroughly. They can drown very easily, okay? Um, because they don't think. They love pools, they love the water, it looks pretty, and they'll just walk right into it, okay? You have to be watching them at all times. And this is due to immaturity of the prefrontal cortex. It makes children impulsive, like we said. They won't stop and think. They'll just walk right in, okay? Um, you know, I remember being with my daughter, uh, you know, we visited Hearst Castle some years ago when she was like two years old and we were walking around. We got to the area where they had that beautiful pool and she just wanted, she was just drawn to this pool. She just wanted to walk right in there. And of course we had to hold her back and say, no, no, you can't go in there. Uh, and that's just the way children are. Okay. And you have to be watching them at all times. 
Um, drowning is a particular problem. Um, you know, it's the leading cause of unintentional death, right? For one to five year olds. Unintentional means it was accidental, okay? Now, sometimes children do get killed by adults, by parents, because they beat the crap out of them and they kill them. Um, but drowning is the leading cause of unintentional death, where it's accidental death, basically, where children just walk right into the pool, right, and drown. One to five year olds, very, very risky because children usually at this time can't really swim. When they're a little bit older, they're a little bit smarter. They can think before acting right. They won't necessarily walk right into the pool. Um, and they might learn how to swim. You know, teach your kids how to swim, by the way, okay? Um, if you can, you know, if you grow up, and if, of course, if you're privileged, it's a lot easier. But if you grow up, you know, with a pool in your house, it's very dangerous, but you can also teach your kids how to swim. I have a pool in my home. And for a long time, I had it there unfilled, right? It needed to be remodeled. And I left it there for years because I knew it was dangerous. Right? I didn't fix it. And it wasn't until my children got older that I finally fixed it. And now my children know how to swim very well. Okay. Actually, my boy, not so much. He's only seven, but my children won't drown anymore. But you still have to watch them, even when they can swim. Okay. You have to watch children all the time. But it's very, very dangerous. Okay. You need to have a five foot fence around the pool. Right. Uh, it's very dangerous for children. Okay. It's a leading cause of death. So if you're going to a place with a pool or you're going somewhere where there's pool, you have to watch your kids all the time. When you go to the beach, when you go to a water park, uh, it's just the way it is. It's very dangerous for them to be around water. And it doesn't even have to be deep, okay? They can hit their head, end up face down the water and drown. Um, other types of uh, injuries and abuse, uh, this is more like abuse. Uh, child maltreatment is the general term uh, that refers to intentional harm or avoidable endangerment of anyone less than 18 years old. When you mistreat children, right, that are less than 18, that's called child maltreatment. And it comes in many forms, okay? Could be child abuse, child neglect, sexual abuse, comes in many forms. All that is maltreatment. Maltreatment, child maltreatment is the general term. You know, the ones that's more general that includes a bunch of others. But children are more likely to be maltreated if they're difficult, right? If they're difficult and they're just hard to raise, you're going to get frustrated. You're going to get angry. You're more likely to beat them and do mean things to them. That's just the way it is. It's a it, it's harder to raise difficult children. You have to be very patient. You have to be a very good mother, a good father, and they're going to drive you nuts, okay? Or if the mothers are depressed, when you're depressed, you're grouchy, okay? You're also frustrated. You're in pain, emotional pain, uh, and you don't treat people very well when you're depressed. Or the family is under stress because of poverty. Poverty, uh, you know, any kind of stress, okay, is actually frustrating. It actually makes people angry, and when people are angry, they're basically, they tend to take it out on their children. They tend to be mean and harsher with their kids and with other people around them. That's why we always have more problems for many reasons in poor areas. It's hard to be poor, right? You're stressed out, you're angry, you're frustrated, and you're being, and your kids are also being exposed to old, unsafe housing with pollutants and all that stuff. It's just, it's always worse for people who are poor. Child maltreatment is actually not rare, okay? It happens a lot. You know, a lot of children get beaten or abused, and uh, it's often not reported. You know, the perpetrators are usually the child's own parents. The child's own parents are the ones who usually abuse them physically, even sexually, or neglect them. We worry about strangers, but it's usually parents themselves who are the ones who hurt their own children, okay? And that's just the way it is. Parents are the ones who have more access to the children, who see them more often. They get frustrated, they get upset, and they may beat them every now and then, or neglect them, or forget about them, or something like that. And, you know, people do things like that. Child abuse, of course, is the delivered action harmful to the child's physical, emotional, or sexual well-being. Well -being. Sexual abuse is a type of child abuse, just so you know. But child abuse comes in many forms. Physical, you beat, you're beating them, emotional, yelling at them, cussing them out, making them scared or stressed out all the time, or taking advantage of them sexually, right? That's child abuse. But sexual abuse is, is a type of child abuse. Child neglect is when you don't provide their, for their needs, their basic physical and emotional needs, right? You don't feed them properly. You don't keep them safe. You ignore them, they get hurt, or you don't feed them, right? Or they're, you're not, you, know, you don't let them go to school, you don't let them have friends. That's, all that is neglect. It comes in many forms. Children need certain things. And if you don't give children those things, then that's considered child neglect. It's a very common thing. It happens a lot, believe it or not, but mostly goes unreported, okay? Reports have increased in 1950, but uh, have decreased after 1990. So it's actually, it, it reports went up, and then they went down again. Uh, and why is it uh, often unreported? Well, I mean, 
Why is it less common now, or not less common, but report less often? Uh, there might be fewer homes with small children. Ch people are having less children nowadays than they did back in the 50s. Back in the day, people had more kids. So there's less kids now and more adults, right? There's also variation in the level of professional scrutiny related to abuse. It just depends on where you are, where you live. You know, in some places, they care more about it. In California, we're in everybody's business here. We, there's a lot of laws affecting businesses and parents that you have to do this, this, and this. You have to follow these rules and these regulations. Some people hate that and say that we don't have a lot of freedom in California because of that. But a lot of those things are meant to protect consumers, protect children. And, uh, you know, there's a, some very important laws that must be followed. In other places, other states, they may not be as, uh, as well, they, they may not care as much. They do care, but I'm saying the laws may not be as intrusive as they are in California, uh, and they may not catch as many people. Um, but in schools here, I mean, there's a mandated reporter thing, right? That if you see that kids are basically have bruises and things like that, you have to report it. If you think uh, that children are being abused or something like that, you have to report it. You know, things like that, right? That there, it varies. You know how much there, how much people are actually looking into this, right? And how much they're reporting it, the laws and all that stuff. But maltreatment is often underreported. When it is reported, neighbors often reported about five percent of the time. Where neighbors hear something or see something. Um, the relatives report about 70%, of, not 77% of the times, right? Because they also, you know, get to see the children a bit more. Um, but it often goes underreported because th those that are abusing their kids often know that they're doing something bad. So they'll often hide, okay, uh, from authorities. They won't, or, or they'll hide the children. They'll isolate them. They'll move frequently, change their addresses very quickly, very, uh, very, uh, uh, very uh, often. And if you know you're beating up your kids and you leave them with bruises, uh, the abusers know very well not to let them go to school that day, not to let them go to school until they, those bruises go away. And they might say, well, the kid is sick or something like that. So they hide these things. And children are often af afraid to report their own parents to say something because why? Because they don't want to be taken away from their parents. It's as simple as that. Or also because they're afraid that the parents really going to beat them even more or abuse them even more if, you know, they report them. They're afraid of their parents. They're afraid of being taken away, of losing their parents. And it's a lot of reasons why it's underreported. Now, how do we prevent this? How do we prevent uh, injuries and abuse? Uh, how do we prevent child maltreatment? So, about, so here's some statistics here. About one in four children have suffered physical abuse. I would say it's probably more common. A lot of parents beat their kids. That's physical abuse. You know, I would say at least half their parents probably beat their kids. That's just my impression, okay? Maybe even more than that. But one in 22 uh, children suffer some form of sexual abuse, okay, before sixth grade. Think about it, that's a lot. And that's, pro that's probably too low, it's probably more common than that, okay? Abuse is always a lot more common than the research suggests because a lot of times we just don't know about it. Warning signs that children are being abused, right? Delayed development. They're not growing properly because they're being neglected, not getting enough nutrition, right? Immature communication. If you're beating them, they're scared, they're frightened, they're traumatized, right? They're not gonna talk very much. They're not really gonna make friends. So unusual social interactions there as well. Post-traumatic stress disorder, a child that's very fearful, easily startled, defensive, or very angry could indicate the child's being physically abused, you know, beaten and that kind of stuff, right? Ne neglected children are often withdrawn and uh, very self-critical. They blame themselves, you know, and um, you know, they, they view themselves very negatively. So they may not make friends, they may not talk. Abused children are often aggressive, they're angry. When you beat them, when you abuse them, uh, especially boys tend to get very angry. And of course, they have this anger, this frustration, they're on edge, they go to school and they can be aggressive with others as well. Maltreated children in general are less likely to have friends. You know, they don't feel good about themselves. They're angry or they're shy or, you know, and that affects development of friendships. Um, how, do pre how do we prevent the, this maltreatment? Um, there's different forms and you have to know the difference between these. There's primary prevention where you change the environment to make injury less likely, okay? Um, you know, changing the environment to make injury less likely, having sidewalks so kids don't get hit by cars, speed bumps to make cars slow down, having crosswalks this is a place where children walk, right? You have to um, have things like that. That's primary prevention. You change the environment to make abuse or make injury less likely, okay? Uh, secondary prevention is when you avert harm to individuals in high risk situations. So flashing lights on school buses, crossing guards, children walking with adults, like schools are high risk areas. So when you do things around there, or things that have to do with school, that's secondary prevention. 
right? Or, or in places like around parks, right? There's different rules, different laws, different speeds. All that is secondary prevention. It's meant to prevent harm in places that are high risk. Tertiary prevention is prevention that happens after an injury where something happens and then they basically change the laws, they change the rules to make that less likely to happen again. So they might have better emergency rooms, change certain things there, pass laws like as hit and run driving, uh, or pass more strict laws, punishing people for certain things. Uh, that's tertiary prevention. It involves usually changing the law, and that usually happens after we find out that something happened that was bad that could have been prevented if this law had been in place. Okay, um, last slide over here. Um, another way to prevent maltreatment, abuse, things like that. There is foster care. Sometimes children are actually removed and taken away from their parents, right? Uh, and they're given to another adult, right? Yes, there are plenty of kids who grow up in foster care. Sometimes parents are really bad and, you know, sometimes they can't take care of their own kids and they give them up for adoption um, or they, you know, or they end up in foster care. Um, but sometimes kids are just taken away from their parents because their parents are really bad. Their parents may be drunks or drug addicts or just really mean and abusive or sexually abusing the kids. Neglectful parents, there's all kinds of bad parents out there. The good news about when kids are usually taken away from their parents is they usually end up in what's called kinship care, where they're given to some trusted relative. So it's usually not a stranger. It could be some grandparents, some aunts, some uncles, somebody else who the child knows. And that's a lot better for the child because they already have some emotional connection there. But, every, but some kids do end up with strangers. Every year, about half a million children are officially in foster care. And there's about another million who are unofficially in foster care, children who are being cared for by somebody else other than their parents uh, because their parents can't take care of them. They're maybe in jail, they're drug addicts, whatever it is, and, or something is going on and, and somebody volunteers to take care of them for them. So there's a lot more children unofficially in foster care, but, you know, half officially, you know, where legally they've been taken away and somebody else is raising them. Permanency planning, finding long, uh, lifelong care for the maltreated child, right? Uh, that can be difficult where you, you know, where children are taken away permanently from parents, right? That does happen, you know, where the, the child is, uh, you know, given up, uh, is, the child is uh, put up for adoption. But adoption is very difficult. It's very difficult for children to be adopted because judges often don't want to release children for adoption. They don't want to break up the family permanently, right? Take the children away from the family, right, from the home. Uh, from the parents. Um, and, and when there are people who are willing to adopt children, uh, they often prefer infants. They want small children that they can mold, right? And, and, and uh, basically, um, and shape. Uh, not older kids, not, uh, not that 12 year old or that teenager, right? Or children who are older, uh, uh, usually higher than seven, because those children have already been affected in some way and they already have trauma and issues and stuff like that. They'd rather get a young, children, a young child that they can raise as their own, so to speak, like, and not even tell the child that they're adopted until later, if ever. Okay. Screening of families also, not all families qualify. You need to meet, have certain income requirements, uh, and other requirements. You can provide a good home, you know, and um, a lot of people don't qualify. And uh, it's, it's often a lot, you know, the people who do qualify, believe it or not, there's more white people more white families that qualify, you know, that are able to adopt children than the ones that are, you know, minority because they tend to be poor. So there are a lot of black children, Latino children who are adopted into white families. And often, you know, the, um, the, the, um, they prefer, the authorities prefer that the children end up with uh, parents that are of the same ethnicity, the same religion, but that isn't always possible. And all this makes adoption more difficult. Okay. Uh, but it does happen. There's a lot of maltreatment in there, a lot of abuse. It always, it all happened. It, it always happens. It's just, it's a lot. We see it a lot less often than it actually occurs. What we see on the, on the news or what we hear about is just a small percentage of what actually happens. Okay. We will um, stop there. Now stop recording.